Hello and welcome to our latest live Find My Pass webinar. Again, it's me, Alex Cox. I'm the man behind those lovely Find My Pass Friday updates you receive each week. And this week, I'm actually joined by a very special guest who has travelled all the way down from the north of England to London to speak for us today, and that is Despite Storm Doris, who's been uh, wreaking havoc across the country today. So I think you've bought, uh, she's been battling trains for the past six or seven hours, but nonetheless, uh, she's here. So my guest this week is... Um, historian, genealogist, and author, Michaela Hume. Uh, and Michaela specializes in Victorian and Edwardian history, and she's been a social historian and professor, professional genealogist for over a decade. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, she's also an associate lecturer and course leader at the Manchester, Metro at Manchester Metropolitan University. She's an editor of the Manchester Regional History Review, and a bit of, must be a bit of a pro at this, because she's also the resident historian on both BBC Radio Manchester and BBC Radio Lancashire. Uh, she's, as I mentioned earlier, published author with the History Press, and on top of all that, I don't know how she finds the time, uh, she also runs her own genealogy company called Unearth the Past. And her two books, A Grim Almanac of Manchester and A Bloody History of Manchester, or is it The Bloody, the Bloody British History of Manchester, are available in all on good online bookstores. So um, Michaela's talk today is titled Social History for Genealogists, and over the course of the next five, 45 minutes or so, she'll be explaining some of the best ways you, uh, you can build on your initial research and add some colour to the names and dates you've got stored in your family tree. Uh, as we know, locations, dates and names are great for placing your ancestor, but they, uh, you want that real so, uh, historical context so, to allow you to see them as real people, I guess. Uh, so from census records to newspapers and beyond, Michaela will be explaining how these records can be used to really bring your family tree to life. Um, a few quick notes. As always, we will be taking questions throughout, so pop any you may have in the box at the side of the screen, and our team of behind-the-scenes ex behind experts will try to answer as many as they can. And, and also, depending on how we do for time, we're going to try and do a little bit of a live Q&A session at the end, so be sure to stick around for that. Uh, finally, don't forget to make sure your volume is turned all the way up, uh, and if for any reason you miss any of the broadcasts, please don't panic, because an on-demand version is going to be sent to you over the next few days, um, and you will also be sent, along with that on-demand version of the broadcast, a special offer code that will give you 50% off a one-month world subscription, so be sure to keep on the lookout for that to make sure you don't miss out. Anyway, that is enough for me. Are you sitting comfortably? I will, uh, I will now pass you over to Michaela. Michaela, thank you very much. Hi everybody and welcome to my webinar. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. I love technology so I'm actually really excited about this because I've never done one of these before. So um, please bear with me with the, the technology. Luckily I've got Alex on hand who if I get stuck I'm sure he'll help me turn the slides over. So as he has um, wonderfully already said, my name is Michaela and I am a social historian and genealogist. Um, and in today's presentation, I'm going to show you how you can really get more from these records. So these records that, that we often get, you know, census records or birth, marriage and death records, they're great at giving us sort of static information like names and addresses. But how can we really dig deep and go a bit further and try and find out some more information? Well, hopefully, once you've um, watched this lovely webinar, webinar, you will have a few ideas as, as to how to do that. So to start with, I'm going to talk about social history and what is social history and how can social history fit into genealogy. So social history has many different definitions and I won't send you to sleep trying to go through them all because to be fair, historians disagree amongst themselves about what social history is. However, I study um, what my field is, is the history of people, and that's particularly ordinary people. The story of day-to-day -day living. Now, I largely focus on the experiences of the middle and the working classes. Um, I generally start in the 18th century, and then I'll go up to sort of the mid-20th century. And I research things such as the character of the family, household life, conditions of employment, um, leisure activities, and then also things like crime and all the, the naughty things that our ancestors got up to that, that they really shouldn't. So um, what sort of questions do I try and answer in my research um, that could possibly help you in trying to find out more about your ancestors? So apart from the obvious, which are things like, oh, where were they born and how old were they when they died, etc., 
I always have questions um, that are not sort of straightforward. So in other words, you really have to do a bit of digging to find the answers to these questions. And I call these my key questions. Now, I'll talk through some of these in a moment. But I always find, as a genealogist, and when I first started doing my family tree, I always had that rush of excitement, you know, after you've spent months digging through records, especially if you're anything like my family and you've got a Jones in Wales. Um, you know, you spend months digging through these records and you finally sort of, you know, you, you find that record that is your ancestor, which is great. So you've probably got a name and an address of a part of the country that you've probably never even been to or heard of. Um, you've got an age and an occupation. But that is really it. So you have to rely on just them few words that are written on that piece of paper. That is all you know about your ancestor. Their whole life is condensed into just a few sheets. So once that sort of initial buzz of finding your new ancestor wears off, you're probably left wanting to know more. Well, if you're anything like me, and most genealogists are, you're probably a bit nosy and have a few unanswered questions. So these are some of the key questions that I that I sort of try and answer. So the first one is, sort of what, str what was the street like where they lived? So I'm not talking about, oh, well, they lived on, you know, uh, St. John Street. I want to know, what was the house like? Uh, what sort of class were they? Uh, was it quite a rough area? Were they posh? Um, and then other questions such as, you know, how much did they earn? Um, again, how big was their house? What did they do to socialise? Did they go to the pub? Um, did they go to the picture house? Uh, again, what social class were they? Were they sort of working class, upper class, middle class? Were they political? Could they vote? And also, what did they do um, in their leisure time? So there are lots of different strands to social history. However, I'm going to sort of group my talk into two areas. So the first area is we're going to look at the home. And then we're going to sort of open the front door and we're going to go into the home and we're going to look at things like family life and standard of living. So as you have probably figured out from looking at the census, generally our ancestors were a very mobile bunch. And it is estimated that over 50% of people living in 1851 were not actually living in their birthplace. So it is likely that your ancestors lived in a variety of different style houses. Looking at an address, um, you know, and, and using sort of Find My Path records is going to really help us to just dig a bit deeper and just actually try and visualise what that house sort of looked like and what the area was like where that house was placed. So I thought what I'd do, um, I'd take you through some typical style, um, typical sort of style of houses. And to do that, what we're going to do, we're actually going to look at the, um, at the 1911 census. And there is a reason for that. Now, what I tend to do, when I go on the 1911 census, I always try and search um, by address. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to actually push forward just one moment just with the slide just bear with me so before we go on the census I'm just going to give you just a few records that will help you um, sort of in your in your search okay so if you want to know more about the home or you want an address these are some of the records that I go to so the census is obviously the most obvious and I'm going to go back to the 1911 census and why that's particularly useful in a minute but also you can get addresses from things like birth, marriage and death records, um, employment records, military records, immigration records are great. Uh, not only it will tell you where your ancestor left, but uh, more often than not you can find out where they were actually going as well. Newspapers, criminal records, electoral registers and rate books. Now, rate books are um, sometimes quite difficult, difficult to find. And there's also actually rent books. Uh, that should be on there as well, which I have left off. Um, but rent books are great if you want to know how much um, your ancestors were, were paying. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go across again. 
and again and here we go so here is um, a very typical slide from the 1881 census now my ancestor is actually on that census and i don't know if you can if you can pick it out but this is a street in manchester now this is actually the only strand of my family tree believe it or not that's actually from manchester they're from absolutely all over the place but i thought um, I thought I'd use this record because it was a record that was to hand when, when I was actually writing this. So here's an example of uh, my ancestors on the 1881 census. So if I'm looking at an address, I can see that my ancestors lived at 26 Rollinson Street. Now, I have never heard of this street. In fact, um, that probably tells me that it's no longer here anymore. So I have no idea what this house was like. As a historian, and if I look at sort of the occupations of the people that are living on the street, um, I could probably uh, gauge that this is a very much a working class area. Now, um, and, and that's looking at things like, you know, if we see there, there's a hardware dealer and there's also um, a glass maker. Again, looking at the occupations, I could probably tell that they are uh, possibly uh, upper working class, so it could be a two up, two down terrace. However, how can I find this out? So we're going to go back to the 1911 census. Okay, now we're going to do a search, but we're going to search by address. So if you look where it says street, I've put in the top there uh, Rollinson Street, and then we're going to hit the search button. I always find if you are searching by address, don't put in too many details because sometimes it won't pick it up. So I try and put... Um, you know, I try and put sort of a, as, as minimal details as possible in the search engine. But if we click on Rollinson Street, then we get a, a long list here of possible addresses. So I'm going to click on the, uh, the first one that says Manchester. Right, okay, so I've got a list of all the, the numbers that are available, all the house numbers on Rollington Street, and then I'm going to click on the number of my ancestor, which was 26. So I've clicked on that. Okay, and then this then gives us the census, which is lovely. So what I really want to draw your attention to on the census is the number of rooms okay so the number of rooms is going to give you some idea of what type of house your ancestor lived on now it is worth bearing in mind that if your ancestor was particularly a working class ancestor like most of mine were you may find that by 1911 nothing comes up for their address and that is because more often than not these houses were, were destroyed in slum clearances, which was going on sort of at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. So you may find that you do not have an address here. However, if you do, the place to look is at the bottom where it says the number of rooms. Now, always worth noting that the kitchen is counted as a room, okay? So four rooms, to me, would be a typical two-up two down terrace however i'm still not sure and i'm kind of half guessing here so what i'm going to do is then this now most record offices throughout the country have brilliant brilliant archives picture archives okay so i know that because i've done quite a lot of work in the, um, in the manchester record office as well as wigan and um, I think Liverpool as well, that they do have really great image archives, but so do others, including sort of London. Um, so what I then did, I decided to go onto the Manchester Image Archive and I decided to type in um, Rolleston Street, which is what I did, and then this picture come up. So this is a picture of my ancestors' home. Okay, so we can see it was very much, um, this is 26 Rollinson Street, very much was a two up, two down terrace. So, worst case scenario, yeah, you obviously have the address, which you can always use maps, by the way. There are great maps out there, um, which you can get your hold of, you know, relatively cheap. So you can always look on a map to try and find the address and then see if the house was there in 1911. 
Always remember, 1911 census, you do not just have to search by name. You can search by address and it will tell you roughly how many rooms that house had. Particularly interesting as well, by the way, if you know, if you um have quite a big family, you know, especially sort of prior to the 1911 census, 12 or 13 people, it's interesting to find out what sort of house they lived in. Um, also, as well, it's worth bearing in mind is the fact that some of these houses were lodging houses. So you can generally tell that by the census, by if you sort of scroll down and you sort of see, you know, loads of different names, it says lodger or border, um, you, would, you can sort of tell that um, by if you look. The difference between a lodger and border is uh, one gets uh, rent and food and the other just gets rent. So it's always worth bearing that in mind as well if you are having a search. So this is a typical end terrace. It's a working class house in a working class community and these houses were expensive. So if your family lived in a terrace, don't look at it through sort of today's eyes, you know, in these working class districts. These were, you know, these were upper working class people if they lived in a terrace. Anyway, I'm going to have a look now and show you some other different styles of, of um, property that your ancestor may have lived in. Yep. Great, thanks, Alex. So the one on the left, the one on the left is a fabulous Victorian, very grand semi-detached house. So you can sort of see there, you can see three floors there, but they would be a cellar. Now, particularly from sort of the 1850s onwards with improved transportation links, so we've got things like, you know, the railway, we have great sort of omnibus service in those days, you really start to see these middle classes. They, they have now left the towns and the hustle and the bustle and the smog and uh, all the sort of the, you know, the grimness of the, the Victorian city, and they are now moving to the suburbs and they are living in these beautiful, big, Victorian, semi-detached homes. Now, if we go, if we look at the picture then on the right, uh, you'll see more terrace-style houses, but I think if we compare them to our working-class houses, you'll see that they're quite a bit different. So we've got the large bay windows, and the most important thing here is the fact they have a garden. So the fact they have a garden would be, oh, you know, they, you're right moving up in your uh, social structure, you know, if you have a garden. And then if we uh, move on again, we'll see the lady at the left. Um, she actually lives above the shop. Now, you do find quite a few ancestors. If your ancestor owned a, sh owned a shop, especially during the Victorian period, the likelihood is that they would have lived above it. And this would have been the equivalent of sort of a modern day flat. Um, so you may have had a bedroom, um, uh, a sort of living area and a kitchen. Or, you know, if, if they sort of didn't have that kind of money, maybe the kitchen and the living area would have all been as one and there would have been a bedroom. Speaking of flats, if we look to the picture on the right, you'll see tenements, which were another popular style of housing, especially in sort of large cities. Now, the tenement was normally made up of two to three rooms, and the occupants would have shared facilities in the court. So you can't actually see really on this picture, but if you sort of um, went over the top of that building and looked down, you would have seen that, you know, there's sort of um, a communal sort of courtyard area, which would have had sort of a privy. Privies were a luxury. So there are places, um, I've been doing quite a bit of research on this at the minute, and I think one street I found there were 280 odd people sharing one privy, sharing one toilet. So privies were a luxury. So if your family had a toilet, especially in sort of the first half of the, um, uh, or should, should we say the 19th century, if they had a privy to themselves, <laughs> that, that, that would have been um, sort of, you know, the eagle-eyed neighbours would have been very jealous if they had their own toilet. So we're going to move on. So, th so these two houses, you know, are fairly sort of, um, or these two types of dwelling are fairly sort of working class. But if we just move on again to the census. Now, this is another census record that I found. And if we have a look um, at, if we go to, if you just sort of look midway down, you will actually see, I think it's number 77, that there are actually two families living in this house. Okay, so 
two families in a house. You can always tell, by the way, if you see this, you should have two little lines just, just to the left of the name. Okay, so you've got 77. Then I think you've got, is it 76? Alex, your eyesight's better than mine from here. Yeah. And then if you just look above, you'll see that there's two little lines on that family. So there's two heads of the household. That's another way to check. Living in number 77. The likelihood is, and we don't actually know this, but the likelihood is that they were probably living in what we call a cellar dwelling. Okay. Now, cellar dwelling, if we just move on to the next slide. Okay, so we've got a typical cellar dwelling on the right, and then we've got back-to-back -back houses on the left. Back-to-back -back houses and cellar dwellings were two of the worst um, style of houses in the 19th century. They were sort of um, they were associated with poverty and they were associated with unhygienic conditions and the middle classes during this time sort of didn't look favourably on these and you'll see that by sort of the end of the 19th century these two style of houses uh, do disappear so they're sort of uh, they're part of slum clearances and they do sort of you'll find that they they were demolished. Um, Cellar dwellings were probably by far the worst. They were dark, they were damp, they generally didn't have any windows and were normally just a single room that could be as little as 10 foot by 12 foot. So it's hard to spot if your family um, was living in a cellar dwelling, but it's always worth noting the amount of families living at one address. And there is a, you know, a chance, especially if you do go to one of the image archives and you can find a picture, um, there is uh, probably quite a good chance that your family were actually living in, in a cellar dwelling. So we've had a look at some styles of property. Now you may be wondering, well, how much were these houses to rent? So some archives, as we've already, pre, uh, already mentioned, do have rent books. Another resource, which is fantastic, is Victorian magazines. There are several Victorian magazines. Um, the Penny magazine is one that springs to mind. Um, they always have sort of articles written, um, you know, written by sort of the middle classes who were trying to reform the sort of the working classes, and they wrote quite a bit about the you know, the, how terrible these cellar dwellings were. So it's always worth checking out some Victorian magazines. Another source that I use a lot in my research are Victorian newspapers. Alex just said he loves the newspapers. <laughs> they, are. <laughs> they are great. Now, Find My Past is brilliant <clears throat> if you want to look at newspapers. They have a brilliant collection. So I would go to the search bar um and put i mean i've written books um consulting newspapers by the way so i go to newspapers for everything so it's just it's just worth bearing that in mind but if you just type in rent and type in your area or do do a sort of search of the um you can sort of search by region and you can also search by paper but if you just search by region of your area and type in rent it will bring you up um some different types of rent it's always worth bearing in mind that the first Two pages normally of the newspaper are adverts, and that is generally because these are quite static. So it was quite easy to create the newspaper by putting the adverts first, because they don't really change. Then all the latest news and everything that's, that's sort of ongoing will be towards the back. So first two pages are adverts. Always worth checking, checking out the adverts and just see if you can get any idea on rent. Now, so we've looked at sort of rent and we've looked at houses, but what about the area? So if you don't live in the vicinity of, of where you're, you know, where you're, you found your ancestor to be, you might want to learn a bit more about the area. So to do that, again, <laughs> I go to the local newspaper. So um, I did a search of the area of, of where my ancestor lived, which was on, um, it was in the neighbourhood of City Road, which is the area of Manchester that we've been sort of looking at. And lo and behold, it turns out that um, it was overrun by gangs. So, <laughs> so which must have been quite worried, to be fair, at the time. But yeah, so I did a search, and it's come up with all these, all these uh, brutal uh, stories of um, uh, the, a, a gang called the Scutlers, which was running riot in, in Manchester in the Ancoats area during the time of when my ancestors lived there. So it is worth 
having a search. Now, I always, because again, I'm really nosy, um, I always stick my ancestor's address, um, generally not the number, but the road in the newspaper, and I always do a search of the newspaper, because you may be surprised what you'll find, um, especially when it comes to things like, you know, was there a house fire on the street, or you know, was somebody murdered? Generally, if it makes the paper, I'm not going to lie, it's not going to be great. Um, so you know, <laughs> it might, you know, it might not be a, a lovely story about your ancestor. However, it's very interesting, and it will give you a sense of the area in in which they lived. So I always, always do a search of the newspapers and just type in my ancestor's address. I think as well when you go to the search engine and you'll, it sort of says name. So you can put the first name and the surname in. I don't do that. I just go to the bit where it says like keywords and I just type in the keyword. But, you know, I search for all sorts in the newspapers. So, yeah, it is a great source. So we've had a look at homes now and we'll now sort of go through the front door and we shall have a look at family life. So what was family life like for our ancestors? Now, I thought I'd start with births, um, and I kind of thought, you know, I thought, I thought it was probably the most logical place to start, to start with birth and, and childhood. Now, there are several different records that I use to tell me about the birth of a, uh, a child or, or a person from the past, and I've listed just some of them above, and I'll just very briefly go through them now. Obviously, um, your parish records. Um, so you've got your baptisms, your marriages, and your burials. Census records, great right the way through. Um, again, it's not going to give you a particular birth date, but it does get you a rough year to work off. Um, birth, marriage, and death records, they're probably your, your, you know, your best sort of, your best records, especially your birth records. Employment records may have a birth on. Military records, if they are there, which again, you know, hit and miss if they are. By the way, if your military records aren't there, do not despair. Have a search in the newspaper. Um, there is the off chance that your ancestor was, you know, mentioned in the newspaper. Maybe they died at war or they were injured. It is an off chance, but it's worth having a look. Immigration records are always great for birth. Um, newspapers, again, sometimes um, the uh, again, me plugging newspapers. Um, sometimes your family may have announced it in the newspaper of a birth. Criminal records, if your ancestor was a bit naughty um, and they went um, to prison, more often than not, they have the, the birth date of the criminal. Bastardy records, I'm going to come on to those in a minute, and school records, which I will mention briefly. So these are just some of the records that I use. Now, if I get a birth certificate, and a lot of people do contact me about this, um, I always look, the first thing that I always look for are the parents. And in my family, I've had a few where the father has been missing. Now, this can affect a person's, a person's childhood. And I always think it's interesting to know about, you know, as a social historian, what your ancestors have been through. What, you know, was life a struggle for them? Um, you know, what did they do for a job? And I think you know, especially when you're missing a parent, I do think that has some effect um, on your ancestors, you know, sort of growing up through childhood, especially during this period when, you know, if you had a child out of wedlock or if your child was illegitimate, you know, you didn't know who the father was, that's something um, in during this period, especially during the Victorian times, that would have been particularly frowned upon as would other things that make no sense nowadays. So if you were a woman and you went out at nine o'clock at night, even in sort of the 1920s, that would have been frowned upon. So it is worth bearing, you know, bearing these sort of things in mind and especially putting things into context about how, you know, how, how we've moved on as a society over the years, but it's always worth trying to put yourself in your ancestors' shoes. So it's always worth checking. You've got your birth certificate, um, if the, na if the address on the birth certificate does not match the address of the person, um, the informant, and you know that that was where they lived, always do a quick search. You might find it's a hospital. Um, I found that with a few of my records. I thought, where's his address? Or I thought, oh, they must have had the child in somebody else's house. She must have just given birth while having dinner. And no, it actually turned out it was a hospital, but sometimes um, you didn't write the hospital's names. You just actually write their address. 
So let's go on uh, to if we have a, a father missing and, and how we can try and solve that. So illegitimate children, as I've already spoke about, they did face a certain amount of stigmatism growing up in Britain. However, just because the father is missing, it doesn't mean that he is unfindable. And I've had a couple of cases um, with clients that have been trying to find you know, grandparents, and I have successfully solved these cases. And that is by using um, records that are generally, they are quite hard to come by, but a lot of local record offices do hold these, and these are called bastardy books. And basically, it's books, and they are made up of um, women. Uh, it's, it's like a court record. That's what, it, if you can try and imagine, that's what it looks like. It looks like a court record. And these are women that have took the fathers of their children to court to try and get maintenance. So even though there is no name for the father on the birth certificate, it doesn't mean that you couldn't necessarily find out who he was. It may mean that you have to consult these books. Now, the ones that I looked at, they weren't searchable by name. They were literally the books, and you had to go through sort of years and search. However, in t both cases, I found the fathers of these children, and they were two separate cases. Both women won their cases. I don't know how you proved it. It must have been very difficult when the, the man's saying he's not my child. But anyway, the judge decided that both of these women, um, you know, th these respective fathers were the father of their children. And one woman, she was awarded 16 shillings per week until the child was 16 years old. It, these are records that if you are trying to find a, a father, a missing father, there are records that are, are worth consulting. So that's just um, a bit of a bit of a side note. So we have spoke about um, oh school records. Before I move on, very important. I love school records. Um, I'm always interested to know if our ancestors could read or write because I think that's we take it for granted now, don't we? Nowadays we just expect that all our ancestors could read and write, but some of them actually couldn't. Just back one. Oh no, we've gone right to the end. Oh, sorry, apologies, oh. This is, uh, uh, apo apologies, this is Alex getting technical and <laughs> skipping my back presentation. Right, back we are back in the game. Okay, so school records. These are on Find My Past and they are brilliant. It is worth bearing in mind that throughout the 19th century, if you're, you know, if you're looking sort of uh, pre sort of uh, 1870, you will find... Uh, Possibly that your ancestor didn't go to school. There were, uh, there were a series of factory acts introduced and later educational acts that stipulated that between, uh, all children between the ages of 5 and 10 had to attend school. And by the end of the century, this was actually raised to 12, unless you lived in a rural area, in which case it was still 11. A quick way to tell if your ancestor um, was literate and they could read or write is have a look at the signatures, especially on things like marriage certificates. If you've got your little cross and it says mark of, then the chances are um, that you know they, they couldn't sign, sort of they couldn't write their name. So you would possibly expect that if you've got a marriage certificate, maybe from sort of um, the late Victorian period. But as we sort of move into the middle of the the 20th century, you do expect that, that your ancestor has had some sort of schooling because it was compulsory. Then, always great records, always uh, worth having a search. And if you want to see what your school looks like, again, go to maps or go and have a look at local image archives. So we have spoke about birth, and now let's move on to my favourite subject of all, which is death. So um, these are just some of the records that I use to look at death. It is worth bearing in mind that death rates throughout Britain were particularly high, especially, again, looking at the 19th century. If we look at Liverpool, for example, just over 60% of labourers' children died before their fifth birthday. You may have noticed, especially if you look at the 1911 census, that, you know, when it gives you sort of how many children were born living, how many children died, you may notice that that is quite high. Um, that the way that that you know that, that these children were mourned any less, or or you know sort of oh well 
a lot of children died in, you know, um, workers' children died. That was the norm. It wasn't these children were still greed. They were still loved. And, you know, they were still, um, even though it's what, over 100 years ago, they were still, they they weren't just a statistic. You know, they were somebody's children. So it is worth bearing that in mind. Um, so just over six 60% of labourers' children died before their fifth birthday, and we're talking sort of early Victorian period now. In the same city in 1841, this is worth bearing in mind as well, the average lifespan of a professional gentleman was 35. Yeah, 35. So, unbelievable, especially if you've got, you're probably thinking, oh, my ancestor lived to 70 odd. That is great. <laughs> that is really great because the average lifespan. That, bear in mind that's a professional gentleman, not sort of um, you know, not sort of a, a working class labourer was thirty five. The child of a labourer, you would only expect to reach their teenage years. So, you know, you're talking eighteen, nineteen, that that sort of age group. One of the biggest killers in the first half of the nineteenth century was cholera. Now Pacific cities had different cholera outbreaks. Have a search of your local newspaper, type in the word cholera, and you may find, you know, that your ancestor died of died of this. So quickly I'm just going to run through some of these certificates for you. Sorry, uh, records. Death certificates, brilliant. Um have a look at what they died of. Does it fit with what was happening at the time? Was it T B? Um that was another another big killer. Burial registers, um I shall talk about very briefly in a moment. Grave receipts I'll talk about very briefly. If you have a death, always worth searching the newspaper for a couple of reasons. The first may be that somebody announced it. So if you can't find it, it's worth searching because somebody may have announced it. Or if your ancestor died in a particularly gruesome manner, it may be worth searching the newspaper because there may be um, a report <coughs> on the death. Wills are another great one. Who did they leave their money to? Was it you? Are you due some? You know, always check the will. That's what I'd say. Military records, um, parish burial records, Parish, um, sorry, burial club records, I'll talk about briefly in a minute, cemetery committee minutes and cemetery maps. So I'm just going to quickly go through cemetery registers with you, um, which is just the next one. And again, um. yeah. Okay, so I got these on Find My Past. These are brilliant. These will give you a grave number. So you've got your... You've got your death record, you knew when your ancestor died, and you want to find out where they are buried. Have a search of your burial registers. They should give you name, age of death. Some of them even actually tell you what your ancestor died of, which is you know, which is useful. Um, address at their time of, of death. Um, who was the minister that sort of um, officiated it? And the grave number. Now, grave numbers are really important and sections of the grave are also really important so you might say it might say section a and then it'll give you a grave number cemetery maps are online um most of them if you you do have to go to individual cemeteries by the way um to, to find them but if you do a quick search generally um a lot of these cemeteries now have friends you know sort of cemetery groups that put these maps online it is worth having a look it will should roughly tell you what religion your ancestor was, although bear in mind that if your ancestor was buried in a public grave, a grave with many different people in it, um, more often than not they were buried in the, the non-conformist section in some cemeteries, I will say that, because it was cheaper. So you may think, oh, that's weird, my ancestor was, you know, Church of England and they're buried in the non-conformist section. That's because it was cheaper, so it is worth bearing that in mind. So another record, now these are a bit of a funny one because... Um, they're not online as such yet, but sometimes you can find them on microfilm if you go to your local records office, are grave receipts. Not all cemeteries have these, but it is worth looking at. So grave receipts are literally a receipt to the person that paid for your ancestor's grave. It will give you name, address, profession, time and date of interment, location of the grave, mode of interment, purchase details and cost. Who paid for your ancestor's grave was important especially in Victorian Britain and that is because you will see there whether it was funded by the state in other words was your ancestor a pauper a pauper is somebody who was basically uh, on poor relief they were funded by the state um, also 
it's always interesting if it so if if it was funded by the state it might say workhouse it might say overseer it might say board of guardians um and it just gives you above um where it shows you sort of how much the grave was another thing because i'm really nosy i want to know how much my ancestors paid for that grave and if you look there i think it says two and six but for a public grave it was normally sort of um seven and six and then it can go up and up and up so we're going to have a look at different types how, of how graves today? oh okay so you'd have to you have to it's kind of it's quite hard because you kind of have to work out with inflation but there is by the way a great if you could actually type it on the internet there's a great way to work out worth so as a historian it's really difficult to try and put sort of um put that in, into sort of context mm -hmm. today because worth sort of has changed over the years so but there is um a website it's free um and I can't remember its name, but if it comes to oh, me, I'll let you know. I think it's in the inflation calculator. Yeah, it's something. Yeah, it does yeah, sound like that. Yeah, and I, will, I always sort of like, I always, whenever I've got money, you know, I'm trying to think, oh, how much was rent? I always stick that in it, and it tries to sort of, yeah, it does give you um, a, a worth okay. of what it was worth today. But if we, but we'll go on and talk very briefly about occupations later on, and then you will see how much that was to a sort of um, seven and six, to a sort of working class man, and how a lot of working class families had to save to, to bury their dead. So we're going to go on to types of grave because you may come across some of these when you do your research. So we have vaults, uh, very expensive, um, the creme de la creme of, um, you know, of, of, of graves within the cemetery. We have brick graves, we have private graves, you may also see freehold graves. Usually they are categorised by class, you've got one to four the most expensive graves, if you have a look at your cemetery map, will always be near the church and on your walkways. So if you go to the cemetery and your ancestor has a grave on one of the walkways, um, I think that they probably spent, um, you know, they were the sort of, um, probably spent a fair few quid on it, to be fair. And, you know, as far as their neighbours are concerned, they were the ones that, you know, they all wanted to emulate. They all wanted to have the grave that was by the sort of the walkway. Public graves, these are often referred to as common graves, you may see them as, or single graves, shilling graves, or pauper graves. Now, it's, uh, some people don't quite define what a pauper grave was. In my research, and I do a lot of research on death, pauper graves were usually just attached to the workhouse. Um, if you have a look generally around cemeteries, and this isn't all of them, there are no sort of um, grave plots that just contain paupers. They all contain a mixture of people that paid for their grave and people whose grave was paid for by the state. So if we just go across, um, so we were speaking before about the expense of, of burials. And you've got a lovely picture there of somebody who could afford to have, to have their coffin transported in, in a car. Now, most working class families paid weekly into burial societies, and that was because they wanted to avoid the pauper funeral. There was a real big stigma, you know, if your family was buried at the expense of the state, and people just didn't want that. It wasn't so much that they didn't want to be buried in a public grave, but they didn't want that, that burial paid for by the state. And more than not, that comes down to customs, because if you, um, you know, if you were paying for your own burial, you could sort of have the body at home, um, maybe overnight, and you could do certain rituals that you, you would want to do. Maybe, you know, close the curtain or, you know, dress your ancestor in a particular outfit. So a lot of people did not want burials that were paid for by the state. So they ploughed money into burial societies. Burial societies started, um, they were run by undertakers, and they were off, they were sort of seen as corrupt because, you know, obviously undertakers had a vested interest in you plowing money into burial societies so they then could make a profit from you burying your dead. As the 19th century progressed, they became better regulated and then um, were attached to schools and other local organisations. So grave receipts will tell you who funded um, your ancestor and if it was a burial society, it is worth checking out sort of the local newspaper or even the local archives that will give you more information on that. As I've said previously, if you had a death certificate and the death was, you know, slightly strange or um, 
maybe it was an accident or it could even been you know sort of a, a murder or whatever type it type the name into the newspaper or the coroner's inquest they're normally done weekly but they are generally in the local newspaper and it is worth checking it out as i say that even if it's not your ancestor just read them because some of them are really really interesting or they're interesting to me but i'm a bit of a murder she wrote fan so therefore you know i do love things like this um so we're just going to finish by briefly talking about occupations Okay, so by 1841, it was estimated that 40% of the workforce in England and Wales were employed in industrial occupations. If we went back 100 years, we will find out that the majority of our ancestors were, you know, tenant farmers and um, they were involved in agricultural occupations. By 1841, this has changed. Cotton manufacturing was the leading industrial sector. So you may find that your ancestor, you know, was a um, weaver, worked in the mill, a uh, spinner, piecer. So cotton manufacturing was the leading industrial sector. The hours in the mill were long. 12-hour days was the norm in most factories. The most common job for women was in domestic service. Now, if we go on to and we look at the cost of living, this is a typical um family um this was i think this is sort of towards the end of the 19th century but if you look this is a working class family so you've got your rent is eight shillings uh meat and fish uh bread grocery i'll let you have a read through those burial insurance beer and tobacco so uh, the average family this was two adults and two children could could spend sort of uh one pound six shillings and four pence wages throughout the 19th century really did vary. So in the north, um, in the 1830s, a factory labourer could earn as much as 23 shillings per week. Um, in London, the wages were, were more. And women, you may be surprised to know, were paid a lot less than men. So if you find that a lot of women in your family, when you're doing your research, were employed in mills, that was because they were cheap. Um, they were cheaper to employ than men. In the 1860s, um, out of work, um, we were going through something called a cotton famine, and a lot of councils, sort of, uh, or should I say municipal corporations, employed out of work cotton workers, and they paid them up to five shillings per day to work on municipal projects. Again, that would depend on their skill. Um, you may be surprised if we look at that list to see how much was spent on beer and tobacco. I was just thinking yeah, that. Were you thinking that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, more than dairy was spent on <coughs> beer and tobacco. If we <laughs> if we think about um, sort of the 1850s, 70 percent of working men spent their evenings in the pub. Beer was important. So now you maybe can understand why they didn't have you know so much money to spend on burials. Um, because they were too busy enjoying themselves having beer and tobacco in the evening. Burial <laughs> um, insurance, a lot of people paid into, as you'll see there, but as I've already mentioned, um, it was a bit hit and miss, actually, whether you got your money out or not. Um, always check the local newspapers, because there are a lot of burial insurance um, scandals and burial insurance companies not paying out during the 19th century. So, so it's always worth bearing that in mind. If your ancestor was an agricultural labourer, that was a particularly difficult job. Winter was hard. They, would have been, um, they wouldn't have been employed. So you may find that during the winter, if you have a birth or a marriage, that they actually had a different job. So it's worth bearing that in mind. Um, some records relating to occupations, I'll very briefly go through these census, election registers, margin death records, trade directories, apprentice records, military records, immigration records, newspapers and criminal records. They will give you um, some idea. If you want to search for the company, you can do that yourself. If they work for a particular brand of company, you may just want to put that in the newspaper and have um, a search. I actually... Um, was researching the family history of, of quite a famous boxer. And when I did a search in the Van Ness Past newspaper archive, I actually found that his family uh, were actually prosecuted <laughs> for making ice cream in unhygienic conditions in the early 20th century. So it is always worth having a search of the newspaper 
um, just for everything in life, really. I think that's the, the, the motto of my talk. So I will end this, this webinar because we don't have, I've blabbered on for quite a while and we don't have much time for questions. So I have tried my hardest to, um, to keep it to sort of um, two areas of social history, but there are many more areas of social history that I am sure <coughs> that you are um, you're interested in. So, if I can answer any of your questions, please get in touch. Mashing, thank you so much for that, McKay. I I thoroughly enjoyed that. I'm, I'm sure everyone else did too. I um, do you know what? one thing I must admit, I've never actually considered was searching newspapers by address. I can't believe I've never tried that before. So that's going to be that's next on my list. And I also loved seeing. Um, the pictures of the old, the old property types, because I actually grew up in two of the different types. So, yeah, when I eventually fled the nest and left my parents' house, I lived in one of those uh, old terrace two up, two downs. Yeah. It was it was interesting. And uh, prior to, uh, my parents lived in one of the more bay window style. With a, they, they still have an outside loo. I remember being terrified of it when I was little because it was full of spiders. Uh, but yeah, that was that was great. So uh, we yeah we've got about nine minutes to get through some of your questions. It looks like you've certainly been keeping us busy. Um, oh, and one thing I will quickly add as well before I go through the questions was don't forget to keep, uh, keep an eye out for that email you'll be receiving, which will contain your on-demand version. So if you did have to pop out for anything, if someone knocked at the door or the phone rang, you can uh, always watch that at your leisure. And alongside that, also keep an eye out for your 50% um, offer code on the One Month World Sub. So anyway, yeah, some questions. One thing I think I should probably uh, we should probably cover first, actually, because I've seen quite a few people asking about this, is whether we could possibly elaborate more on bastardy books. Yeah. So what they include and potentially where you can find them. So I'll hand you back over to Michaela. Hi. Uh, yes, these are a great source that not many people are aware of. Um, the ones that I've come across and used in my research have all been sort of 20th century. So you're all sort of talking, I think they were like mid 20th century, so 1940s, 1930s, something like that. It's worth searching for them at the local records office. Now, um, they are called bastardy books, which obviously in today's context is not a very nice word, but that is actually what, what they are called. It is worth checking with your local archives because they may have, even though they may be called that, you know, we may have uh, given them a more modern name, sort of, um, I don't know, court records or, uh, you know, uh, it was sort of a family support style document. They do give you information, so they'll give you the father's name, they'll give you the father's occupation, and they'll also give you the outcome of what happened and, and the father's address. That is great. If you've got the father's address and you're trying to find a father, then quickly go to your electoral registers, especially sort of, you know, if we're in, if we're 1940s, I mean, the 1939 register, if it's around that period, and then have a look and try and find him on the electoral register. If you find him on the electoral register, see who else is in that house. Um, if there are people by the same surname, they could be relatives. That will help you if you're then going on to try and find, um, you know, sort of that person today. Because when you then try and look for a marriage for that gentleman, you can then cross-reference it by thinking, well, I know who his father is, you know, he lived with his dad or whatever. You've already found that out. So, because you always need something to cross-reference when you're coming up to sort of, um, you know, when you're sort of moving forward and you're trying to find that person sort of in today. So I always check that out. So once you've got an address, you can then use that address, use electoral registers, and then try and find that person coming forward. So, um, yeah, I hope that helps. As I say, Bastard Records, check your local records office. They may be called something different, but they are a great resource. Lovely. So that was uh, question number two, and I'm going to... I'm Pretty much picking these at random. So then, yeah, here we've got a question from Pat Ballard. So thank you very much for sending this in, Pat. Pat has asked, this is quite an interesting one, um, what were the working hours likely to have been for a general domestic servant working in London's East End in the 1890s? Would she have had a social life? And if so, what would that have been like? Hello. Hi, Pat. Yes, she would have had a social life. Working hours were long. Now, by this point factory hours were changing so we were getting Saturday afternoons off we were seeing things like you know the rise of sports uh, the rise of football however domestic servants were in a slightly different category because some of them actually lived um, you know lived at the house in which they worked 
they would have still got time off and they would have um, got evenings off. Um, and yes, they would have socialised if she was a female. She uh, wouldn't have gone out in the evening alone unless she was with another female or she had a chaperone. Um, but we have dance dance halls. Um, you know, sort of uh, dances were really popular, really popular, especially towards sort of the end of the, the, the 19th century. So, yes, and then obviously... Um, there was the, the pub, the public house. Now, by this point, if you were sort of middle class, you wouldn't have gone in the public house. You were going to music halls. Um, you know, it was very much a, a class divide by this point. You were going to music halls. You were going to the sort of private members clubs and, and that sort of thing. But yes, you would have had a social life. Getting back to your question, sorry, I know I've just deviated off slightly. Working hours were long um, for domestic servants, especially if they lived within their property, but within the property in which they worked. However, fingers crossed, um, there would have been somebody else to relieve her, so you know she may have done sort of. Um, she once she sort of settled the family down for dinner, then she may have been relieved to have gone home. But then she would have had to been, depending on the type of servant she were she was, she would have had to been back again in the morning to get the family ready for breakfast. Um, so yeah, I hope that helped working hours along. And yes, she would have had um, a social life, but it would have depend on one if there were any other domestic servants. Uh, working for that family, and two, depending on how nice her boss was. So, um, thank you for your question, and I shall pass you back to Alex. Lovely. I hope I think we've got time for a few more. We can. Always, it doesn't matter if we overrun by a minute or two either. Uh, so, next one, uh, another interesting one from Fiona Stone. Uh, it could be a tricky one. So, uh, Fiona has found an ancestor listed as a prisoner on board the Hulk Just Justinia. Actually, that's a Hulk I've seen in loads of our records. Uh, and he was pardoned, uh, he or she, we don't know, actually was pardoned in 1843. And then, oh, no, no, it does say he. Uh, he then disappears from sight. Uh, where would you suggest go looking next for more information about where he ended up? Okay, well, if he was pardoned, obviously, um, you know, he was then, he was uh, found sort of not guilty or the crime or, you know, they've sort of left him off the crime or, or whatever's happened. Obviously, you've got your census record. Your next census record is 1851. If you can't find them, always put in um, different variations of name. I don't think anyone's ever got my name right. Um, or should I say my ancestor's name right? So put in different variations of name. Could it be that um, the sort of whatever your ancestor was pardoned for, maybe he decided that he wanted a fresh start and went abroad? So could it be that he um, emigrated somewhere else, um, America, New York? In that case, what you need to do is obviously look at things like Ellis Island and look at other sort of records. Um, so, yeah, so that is one possibility. So check check your census records. If you can't find them on the census records, again, do a search in the newspapers. I love the newspapers. Do a quick search or check some of the immigration records. Did they go abroad? hope that helped slightly. Here's Alex. No, that was sound advice indeed. Um, oh, this, this, this is a fun one. Oh, yeah, great. Uh, this one is from Chan Sellers. thought we should de definitely try and answer this one quickly. So while watching your presentation, uh, Jan has actually seen a name on the right-hand side of, I think it was the school register slide for Ireland. Uh, the name was William Seabrook, and Jan thinks that could be relevant to her research. Is there any chance of knowing the source of this slide or getting a copy of the image? I... Oh, it was, well, it, well it's, it's in our Find My Past school. Uh, okay, so was that just one kind of pulled out at random from the... Uh, okay, so, yeah, Jan, I would recommend looking in our national school registers and logbooks and typing in the name William Seabrook, and hopefully you will you will find him in next no time. Oh, great, so I think, actually, I think we've got time for uh, a few more. Let's find some... Uh, um, are women's occupations, oh, sorry, this one's from Nicholas Shaw. Uh, are women's occupations always recorded in the census? If a lady doesn't have an occupation listed, does that normally mean she didn't have an occupation or it just wasn't recorded? Actually, I've often wondered that because you do see, you very rare, in the earlier censuses, you very rarely do see occupations next to the women's names. I'm assuming a, a fair chunk of them must have been working. Is this Nicola? Hi, Nicola. Um, yes. So, 
it really would depend on on the sort of the family size. So if your family is a is in the social class, should I say, of your family? If your family is very working class, and you know they live in a working class area, and you have a look on the census, the chances are that they would have been working. Maybe if they had small children, they were bringing up the children. However, it would depend on how much money was actually being brought into the household, whether they needed to work. And I think that's the thing, really. If they um, the way the sort of Victorians, you know, the Victorians liked it, where the the lady she ran the domestic side of the house, so she was she was in control of the house, whereas the husband he went out and he worked and he sort of brought in the money. But the woman was very much in control of the household herself. Um, so it is worth having, as I say, I'm not quite sure of your ancestors, but if you have a look um, and sort of see where they lived and maybe what their occupation was, then you'll get some sort of um, some sort of idea of whether she sort of had to work or not. So it may be that she actually wasn't working and she was bringing up children, or it may be that it just wasn't on. There's no sort of right or wrong as to whether whether they were put on or not. I think it was more on when the sort of enumerator came round. It was, you know, wife's occupation. Well, you know, if she had one, it'd go on. If she didn't, it didn't. But no right or wrong, really, to be honest. No, I can't really comment. So I would say... Have a look at the social history of your family, picking up on some of the things we've said, and did she need to work? If she did, um, the chances are that she has, she is in employment, it's just not listed. Hope that helps. Hope that helps a bit, Nicola, anyway. Cool. And yes, I, I guess one thing I'll always add as well is one thing to remember about censuses is the information listed is only ever as reliable as the informant. It's only as accurate as the person who supplied it wanted it to be. So that's always something to bear in mind. And we have overrun, but I think one very quick question, uh, if you can try, if you can answer this maybe in perhaps under a minute, <laughs> so we'll have to try. Um, this is from Nicola Shaw, and Nicola has um, asked how would be the best way to going. How, what would be the best way of going about finding more about your ancestors' hobbies and interests? Hi, Nicola. Um, again, this is quite a hard question to answer because there aren't many records about this. However, as with everything in Victorian Britain, um, it's quite sort of class specific. So, if your if your um, ancestors were sort of maybe male in sort of the the end of the sort of 19th century, you start to see the rise of football, um, and you also start if you see the public house. If you look at public houses built at this time, they're also now uh, building sort of uh, uh, balls courts and um, snooker. Well, uh, was always a massive. Um, massive hobby of the Victorians and you'll see the snooker halls it was very sort of a very much a middle class sort of sport so what you kind of need to do is sort of think about your family think about maybe uh, you know were they male or female and what class were they and there are there are not sort of a unless they were a member of an organization or society in which case you know they may have been listed in the local newspapers subscribing to a particular sort of um organization like you know the women's tennis club for example um it's it is worth having a search if not have a look at um local records that may be held in your in your local records office that may sort of you know they may have um i don't know the the men's you know the men's sort of football archive you know something like that you might have to be a bit more sort of specific and try and think a bit outside the box and think okay what sort of class were my ancestors and you know were they male or or female but a lot of newspapers, if your ancestors sort of um, subscribe to a particular sports club, um, they will be in that. Other thing, public house is always um, a, a real sort of big leisure time activity. So have a look on a map, have a look where your ancestor lives and see see which was the local pub. That's also worth checking out. And then go on the image archives and see what it looks like. Think, oh, my ancestor probably drank beer in there. Um, anyway, hope that helped. <laughs> I love that. If in doubt, check the local pubs because that's probably where they'll be. Great. Well, thank you again so much, for Kayla. That was really, that was brilliant. I hope we get, I hope we can get you back for part two. Um, and I must also add, Michaela has been suffering for her art today because thanks to uh, what we, what we in the UK are calling Hurricane Doris, uh, she's now stranded in London after being stuck on trains for seven hours and has no foreseeable way of getting home. So thank you again for uh, taking what ended up being the very long time of coming down and giving that talk for us. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, please join us next time. And as always, don't hesitate to uh, get in touch with us on our Facebook or Twitter and let, uh, give us any feedback. We're always keen to hear what you think.
let us know if, if there's any topics you'd like to see us uh, cover in the future, or, or if, if, any, or if Find My Past or any of these webinars have helped you crack any mysteries, uh, do let us know. You can send an email through to testimonials at findmypast.com because we, we love hearing your stories. So thanks again for joining us, and uh, hopefully you'll be with us next time. Enjoy the rest of your weeks and have lovely weekends. Bye.